I have a very heavy heart this morning for this church. I love this church. Amen. I love this church. I love each and every one of you. And I want to tell a story this morning, a story of my life over the last several years. Six years ago, my understanding of who God is changed. And through a process of time and my own study, I came to no longer believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. According to the Adventist denomination, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, um, I am part of a divisive movement. I've come to find out that they're not necessarily wrong on that. There's no shortage of extreme, fanatical, divisive people that believe the same way that I do. But I found that there's also, on the other hand, no shortage of extreme, fanatical, and divisive people still in the church on the other side. So the message this morning is entitled, A Message for Adventists Concerning the Godhead Controversy. Let us pray. Father, please be with us. Please be with me. I am unworthy. I've made so many mistakes in my life. I've had one failure after another, and yet you're so faithful and so good. And I know you brought me and my, my family here and connected each one of us with you. Uh, connected me and us with uh, each person in here. And Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose. And I see that that plan and a purpose is, is so great beyond what we could even imagine. And Father, we let the devil come in and divide and destroy the work that you're trying to do. Please be with me. In Jesus' name, amen. I apologize if I get a little emotional, but I've been through a lot. We've been through a lot. You know, over the past several weeks, if you're uh, in the right social media bubble, now I know this uh, may, this message is not necessarily for the people that are in here. It's also for the people that are out there. But we need to hear this message uh, in here. But it's also for people outside of this little church. And so some things may not make sense to all of you, but just pay attention. You'll, you'll get it, and I believe you'll be blessed by the end of this message. Yeah. But over the past weeks, several weeks, if you uh, are in the right social media bubble, you will have noticed that there is an increase uh, in agitation over the Godhead issue or controversy within the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I say bubble because it really is a bubble, and we get into our own little bubbles, and we think we have everything figured out, and the fact is we know nothing as we ought. Amen. And that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things on social media, I hope you're not uh, spending too much time on social media because a lot of what happens, the debates, the bickering, the fighting that's going back and forth, uh, I find it to be very vile and disgusting, and it is an abomination, and it makes me want to vomit. Well did Christ say in Revelation chapter 3 that I will spit you, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He's talking to us. He's talking to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And if anything, this controversy has brought about an exposure of what is on the inside of each and every one of our hearts. In 1 John 2... Verse 15 through 16, John says, Love not the world. Is that what he says? 1 John 2, 15 and 16. 
says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And just like the Pharisees that we read about in the Gospels, Jesus said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is the Seventh-day Adventist church and most of the people within the denomination. I don't want to make a blanket judgment. Obviously not everybody, right? But got to look around and I see nothing but division and it's like, are we reaching the world? Are we giving the message? Well, everybody thinks that their little sphere of influence is, is the right ones. This message, and I know you're looking with the confused, don't worry about it. I know you know nothing that's going on and I hate to have to address it. And for those that are watching later on this video, um, that's why I love this church. Because <laughs> some people have no idea what I'm even talking about, right? And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm going to be telling my story and the story of this church. And so, and yes, this church and what I've seen. So, you know, many people that are arguing online and arguing and debating, uh, many of them do not have the love of the Father. Even though they claim to know God, they claim to know the Father and serve the Father, and yet they do not have the love of the Father in them. And that love is a love for a lost and dying world. You know, people are fanatical, but they're not fanatical about the things the Bible you know, tells us to be zealous about. Many people love their own opinions. It's called the pride of life. When COVID hit in America, 2020, a lot changed for me and a lot changed with this church. You know, a lot changed when Jerry passed away. Jerry was the one, the pastor that was leading in this church and he passed away. And I think all of us were wondering what's gonna happen. I know I was wondering, like what's gonna happen? Lord, what do you want me to do? How am I gonna interact with this church? But COVID hit and I feel like I entered the school of Christ. You know, when you join or leave, I should say, when you go outside of a denominational structure, such as the Seventh-day Adventist Church or any other denomination, uh, it's like the Wild West. And you have your famous gunslingers called evangelists that there is no restraint. And you see this on social media. There is no restraint. The Spirit of God is not restraining these men. And so they come and they use the truth as a weapon and they're shooting people down. You've seen it before, right? It's like the Wild West. I didn't realize how sheltered I was until I stepped outside of the denomination. I didn't realize what it was like. I was very naive and I was very sheltered. I worked in the denomination and I guess I had a uh, a naive mindset, but it was very eye-opening when I uh, stepped outside of the de denomination and I saw what was happening. The truth in the wrong hands does more damage than good. It causes more confusion than clarity. And if we haven't figured that out yet, then what are we doing? It's the, the problem is all these men, all of us running around think that you know what? I have the truth. Everybody else is wrong. You know, that's what I had to unlearn when I entered in the school of Christ. Amen. For those that may be watching later on, there may be some that dismiss what I have to say even before I say it, say it because they already know that I'm in error. That's the problem. That's the problem. And that's what I had to unlearn, that attitude, that spirit. I think it's something we all need to unlearn. In order to learn that lesson, God allowed COVID to happen. And since this church is not affiliated with the conference, we stayed open the whole time. Something we prayed about and we felt like we're not going to close these doors no matter what, unless the police come and tell us to shut the doors. If you know, people want to come, praise the Lord. If you want to stay home, stay home. But we're not closing the doors. 
And so uh, God sent a couple people during that time. I'm looking at them right now. Glenn, Evelyn, Gary, Sharon, Nikki. One of the first things that Glenn said to me, I don't know if you remember this or not. <laughs> I hope you don't mind, brother. You said, I appreciate that you stayed open. But I can't believe that Jesus was created and there's no Holy Spirit. You said those exact words to me. And I said something back. I said something like, well, that's not what I believe either. And you were pretty sure that that's what I believe. But when you said those things, that pride of opinion welled up in my heart and I wanted to cut you down. You realize that? That's how we are. He disagreed. He doesn't know who God is. I am right. I have the truth. Here I stand. I will go no further. And we cut people off. And that, 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 that pride started to well up in me. And, and like I wanted to fight. But you know, we've been through so much that I came to the point like I'm done fighting. I'm done arguing. I'm done debating. I'm done with all of that. And you know what? That was very freeing for me. Because then I was free to just get to know you and, and love you. But it's that pride of opinion. But you see, typically in those situations, either the, the, the pastor or the elder, when, when somebody comes in with uh, something that is against the established belief of the church or of the pastor or of the elder, they usually run them off, typically. But I'm not the pastor here. We don't have a pastor. Christ is our pastor. Amen. Christ is the head of this church. Amen. No man is in charge of this. We don't have uh, elected positions. We don't have uh, church membership. We don't have any of all of that because Christ is leading this church. Amen. And I know it without a doubt. Amen. That's why I'm preaching this message because there's so many things that I had to learn in the last four years. And God sent somebody that disagreed with my creed in order to teach me a lesson. You know, a creed is more than a statement of beliefs. A creed is more of an attitude that I've set. I have the truth. I've set my stakes and I won't budge. You're all wrong. And as far as I'm concerned, you all can go to hell. That's the attitude that we have many times. I have seen people that have been friends for 20 years, 30 years, family members. I've had personal friends that when I came out, I said, I'm a non-Trinitarian, you're going to hell and you're sending your family there. It's on both sides, brothers and sisters. It's on both sides. I used to live and die by my creed. You know, the thing about creeds is you set the stakes. You say, this is the truth. I, I, I will not budge an ounce or an inch or anything like that. And, and, and then you turn around and, and you found some truth. And then you turn around and, and you start looking at other people differently. And you start judging them by your creed. I mean, you probably all know this, like Sabbath. Have you ever had the mentality of like, hmm, Sunday churches, you know, at least Sunday, Sunday people. You ever had that mentality? I have. And a lot of Adventists ha have it. And you know what? That's the attitude. That is the creed. That is actually Babylon. Because Babylon, if you understand the history and, and, and the rise of the papacy, it started with the creed, interestingly enough, the Nicene Creed. And it's the very thing that gave rise because the church said, okay, let's come together. This, this is what happened in the, Ni the Nicene Council, if you want to know the history of it. The church, there was so much division over the doctrine of the Trinity. There was this guy, Arius, that said, no, God is not a Trinity. Then there was other people, Athanasius. This is around 300 AD. Uh, 
Interestingly enough, it was Constantine that called this council of the churches together, and they all decided, they came together, and they studied it out, as men do, and they said, okay, this is what we uh, have agreed is the right belief. And what do you think they did? Anybody that didn't believe that or agree with that, they started to persecute. They said, oh, well, they're not true Christians. They're not true Christians because they don't believe in this. And then they went about to start persecuting and saying, oh, okay, you're, you're, you're not only, not only are you Christians, you're going to burn forever and ever in hell. And then they sought the power of the state in order to enforce their beliefs. You know, a lot of Adventists are on step four and they don't even know it. They have no idea. So when Sister White says, you know, some of the, those that are going to be the foremost in persecuting. I used to live and die by my creed. Every, it was everything to me as an Adventist. I judge everybody but what, by what I knew to be the truth. And then God sent Glenn and Evelyn and Gary and Sharon. And I was in a little bit of a conundrum. I'm just telling the story as it is, as I see it and I understand it and what the Lord has taught me. I was in a conundrum, and this is why. I recognize the situation, and, and I, I recognize that God had sent you, sent you for whatever reason. I knew it wasn't right simply to say, okay, I don't want you here because you don't agree with the rest of us. Like, you can't come and fellowship with us because you don't believe exactly like, that's not right. I don't think it's right for the, you know, the Adventist church. I don't think it's right for this church. I don't think it's right for any. You can't come and fellowship. I, I don't buy that attitude. I think that's wrong. So it's like, okay, well, I can't kick him out of the church. It's like, but I, I, I don't. Like, Lord, what do you want me to do? The natural man would say, okay, next Sabbath. <laughs> next time it's my turn to preach. I'm really going to hit it hard. That's what men do. But you know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me, don't preach it. And I haven't preached it in four years in this place. I haven't preached it in four years. A lot of people have noticed. And you know what? While I was in the school of Christ... So many things I had to learn, you know. We used to receive a lot more money. And because I stopped preaching this. You know, I'm considered to be ecumenical among some of my brethren. I've compromised according to some of them. I'm in heresy. I'm in error. Not only do I get it from the church, I get it from my own brethren simply because you guys are here. Do you realize that? <laughs> simply because you guys are here. People have left. People have left this church because I, because the Lord told me not to preach it. And I did it. And people have left this church because they thought, you need to dress the elephant in the room. You need to tell them and you need to set them straight. But the Lord wasn't telling me that. So who was telling them that? That was not the Lord. Because the Lord said, keep your mouth quiet. I have something to teach you. That's not easy, right? We're going to get there, right? So, but the problem was, like, I had just come out of a situation where, uh, like I said, I was a little bit naive and things, and it's like, oh, we're... You know, we're part of the remnant of the remnant of the remnant, and we're going to finish the work and usher in the second coming and all of this, you know, strange ideas that we uh, kind of think about ourselves. But you know what? Like when I entered into and, and started getting associated uh, with a lot of the non-Trinitarians and, and, and preachers and this movement of people, it was not my doing, by the way. The Lord just... You can tell that another time, but orchestrated everything. 
But I heard over and over again about how the denomination just did them wrong. It's like the denomination, uh, you know, they, they, they wouldn't listen to what I had to believe. You know, they, they wouldn't give me a chance. You know, they wouldn't, uh, you know, they, they, they kicked us out and they were, they were very rude. So I heard so many stories of people accepting the non-Trinity message and then the, the church kicking them out. It's like, okay, you know, that's wrong. But then pretty soon, a lot of those same people did the exact same thing to other non-Trinitarians, just on a different issue. Amen. And it was like, hello? If it's wrong for the church to do it to you, how is it right for you to do it to somebody else? And see, that's the problem. Like, we're, we're on our team, you know? It's like, well, you, you, you can't go against your own team. It's like we, had, like we joined a club or something. Like, this is what church is now. It's a club. Like, we're on the same team, and, and, and we're on the, the remnant team here. And it's like, we have that mentality. And it's all manner of evil, all manner of ungodliness and unrighteousness and evil speaking is allowed and even encouraged, and it's okay and tolerated if they're on your side. Have you noticed that? That's the spirit of Antichrist, brothers and sisters. That is Babylonian. Amen. That's papal. It's what, what they did to Christ. I mean, you look at the Dark Ages. They justified every single ungodly behavior because the church was the mother church and had the truth. And so they were allowed to persecute heretics. Well, people have that same spirit today, all while claiming to serve God. And know who God is. Have mercy. mercy. That's right, Alan. Have mercy upon us. I didn't realize how blind I really was. But, you know, I noticed that a lot of the same controversies and debates that are in the church are also outside of the church. And so, you know, if you think the non-Trinitarians are a united force, uh, you know, they're... It's not the case. You know, the same problems that exist in the church are the same problems that are in all of its subsidiaries. The nature of sin, nature of Christ, King of the North, feast days, God is not killed, 2520, flat earth. Should I keep going? (laughs) If you understand all of those controversies, then I'm sorry. I watched in horror as people... They did the same thing that they tr- criticized the church for doing to them. That's called hypocrisy. And in my heart, I couldn't do that to Glenn. It wouldn't be right for me to stand up here. Oh, yeah, you can come here. You can worship and, and, and fellowship with us. But every chance I get, I'm going to make sure that you know the truth. Every chance I get, I'm going to try to insert it, even in Sabbath school. I'm going to divert everything to, so that you can know the truth, and i got to get my little jabs in. And that's happened here. The Lord put it on my heart not to fight. And I haven't preached this topic in four years, and I feel like now is the time to address it. You know, the same burden, DeMario, uh, the Lord put on DeMario's heart. You know, he was in the same, same position, same thing. The Lord brought us together. And we talked about it. It's like, I don't know what the Lord is doing. You know, I don't know what, what we should do. But, you know, I, I, you know, it wouldn't be right to kick him out. It wouldn't be right to, 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 to keep hammering it. So, anyways, the Lord told me not to preach about it. So I'm going to preach about it now. Turn to me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and it was about uh, when I was traveling with my with my family. I was sharing a lot about the non-Trinitarian message, and the Lord gave me a very special sermon, a a series of verses that I want to share right now. John 17 verse 3. This is one of the, you know, the the one that is you know, uh, a key verse exactly that is shared over and over again. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
according to this text, true eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ. Now, a non-Trinitarian perspective, they look at that and say, or we look at that and say, oh, the only true God. It calls the Father the only true God. And then obviously the response is, oh, well, Christ is not a true God. Christ is a false God. And then it's like from there, like all communication breaks down and nobody's really listening. <laughs> it's like over and over again. A knowledge of the one true God and Jesus Christ. You know, Edmonds talk a lot about the Sabbath. It's in our name. But in many respects, the Sabbath is elevated above everything else. It's just kind of like the, how the Jews viewed the temple. You know, they would say, the temple, the temple, the temple. Well, Christ comes along in Matthew 12, 6, and he says, a greater than the temple is here. Right? It says a greater, than the temple, uh, a greater person than the temple is here. You know, with the, with the Sabbath, you know, Adventists, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. But what about the God of the Sabbath? Like the Lord is above the Sabbath. He's the one that gave the Sabbath. And so like it is vitally important to not just keep the Sabbath, but to know the God of the Sabbath. Amen. Eternal life is, 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 is everything is based upon a knowledge of God. Like, the Bible cannot get any more clearer that eternal life is about knowing God and Jesus Christ. So there's really nothing that is more important. But, you know, some people, whether you're on a Trinitarian or Tritheist or, or Three Beans or Duo, or there's all these, these names, right? There's a tendency to think that if we are able to identify who God is, that that makes us righteous. Okay, there's, there's a knowledge of God, and then there's a superficial knowledge of God. A superficial knowledge of God would say, I'm able to identify that God is a trinity or not a trinity, and because of that, because I have this knowledge, that makes me more righteous. I'm sorry, Judy. <laughs> I know you're looking at me like confused and everything, but um, this is going to make sense for a lot of people that, that aren't here and some people that are here. Adventists, you know, they think, well, you know, I've arrived because I've started keeping the Sabbath. But it's more than that, right? It's more than just going to church on a certain day. Amen. And knowing God is more than just being able to identify whether he's one, two, or three, and how those relate to each other. A knowledge of God is deeper than that. Turn with me to James. Here is the kicker. James chapter 2, 19. This is... Uh, a verse that the Lord just impressed uh, very, very, very heavily on my mind. James 2, verse 19, it says, Thou believest that there is, what? One God. One God. Thou doest? Well. well. You believe that there is one God. You're doing well. That is a good thing. But then what does it say? The devils. The what? The devils also believe and tremble. So, come on, let's just think about this for a second. Every single devil or fallen angel, they all got kicked out of heaven. They know exactly who God is. They know who Christ is. They know the relationship between the two. And guess what? They're still devils. They're still devils. And there's a lot of people that have come to what they believe to be a knowledge of the truth, and they know who God is, and yet they're still devils. They're still devils. Can be a, you can know without a shadow of a doubt who God is, and you can yell it to the rooftop all your way to hell, all the way to destruction. You'd be proclaiming, the truth. I mean, even the demons, they told Christ and they said, what do we have to do with thee, thou son of the most high God? Like, they proclaim the truth. <laughs> but
but it goes deeper. You know, turn to me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. One of the strongest rebukes in the Bible. One of the strongest rebukes. You know, when I first read this, I mean, I, maybe I read it, but when I first was coming back to Christ in my early 20s, and I remember reading this and just weeping, just weeping. Matthew 7, verse 21. It says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, can you imagine the shock? Can you imagine? Put yourself in that position. Could you imagine the Lord saying to you, I never knew you. Now notice it doesn't say you, you never knew me. You see, they thought they, they did many wonderful works in Christ's name. And so they thought that they knew God. They knew God. They knew Christ. And yet, what? It says, I never knew you. Why? Because the truth never, never traveled from here to hear. And they went about their whole lives doing ministry and doing many wonderful things for the Lord and for the kingdom. And they were fighting for the truth. And guess what? They were lost. Christ says, I never knew you. There's many people that have, they know without a shadow of a doubt that they know who God is. But the, does God know who they are? Have they given themselves completely and fully over to Christ? I never knew you. You had a theory, an intellectual understanding, but it never made its way to the heart. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, because eternal life is based upon a knowledge of, of God, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. By the way, I'm going to get a lot of, I'll probably get a lot of heat uh, on this when I put this online. Some people are not going to be happy about that, but that's fine. I really don't care because I know what the Lord is doing here. Like, I know what the Lord is doing, and it is incredible. And I'm so excited about that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, born of God and knoweth. knoweth God. So what is the true knowledge of God that we're to have? That God is love. And if you don't love, then you do not know God. Even though you can be like the demon and say, oh, I know exactly who God is. If you do not have his character, Amen. you do not know God. Amen. Simply put. And there are some loud mouth, arrogant, self-centered, bigoted religionists that are troubling the church of God. Wolves in sheep's clothing that are biting and devouring the sheep because they're more interested in themselves. And that's on both sides. Yeah. That's on both sides. <clears throat> now, this is the same John that wrote in John 17, 3, that eternal life is based on knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ. It's the same John. How did he interpret it? He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, what kind of love in Exodus chapter 34? We won't go there for sake of time, but it says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and long-suffering, uh, gracious and long-suffering, abundant in what? Goodness and truth. 
So I want you to paint it like paint it, but all of heaven, all of heaven is looking down right now at us. And there are people that go around claiming to know the only true God, and yet they do not act like him in character. They're not merciful. They're not gracious. They're not long suffering. In fact, we live in a society that is, is far from long suffering. It's not patient. We want results right now. And guess what gets results? Controversy and division. Yeah, we're election season. Controversy and division. I mean, you can make a lot of money being very controversial and being very divisive. And there are some specifically on this topic that are very controversial and very divisive and they are making a lot of money over six figures some of them you know god upholds truth and yet he's righteous he's long-suffering he's gracious it's not a compromise to the truth to bear long and to suffer long with someone. You don't think I wanted, like I wanted to preach about it, right? I wanted to preach about it. I, like I feel like I, I don't want to be in the situation where I can't be myself. I can't share what the Lord puts on my heart. I don't want that to be the kind of environment here where you can't, uh, can't share. But at the same time, like with freedom comes responsibility. And we have to consider each other. We have to consider others better than ourselves. That's what it says, Philippians. And so I, I, I think it's, it, it, is that in Philippians? Esteem other better than themselves? Is that Philippians or Colossians? I forget the reference. For their Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's in that. Philippians 2. So God upholds his truth, and yet he is righteous. He is just and the justifier of the ungodly. So it's not a compromise to the truth to be long-suffering with someone that disagrees with you. Amen. In fact, it's harder to be silent sometimes. Amen. The easy thing to do is to approach that person, say, you're wrong, walk away, I did my duty. I shared the truth. That's, that's the attitude so many people have. And it's disgusting because it's like, you don't actually love those people. Like, I know what it means to be long suffering because that's a lesson that the Lord taught me to get to know you guys and you guys and Nikki. Because after we've said, like, it's so easy to cut people off and just divorce ourselves. That's our society. Divorce, divorce, divorce. Let's get into, like, we're groomed. Do you not realize? Like, we're groomed and trained in order to get into relationships and break them off, break them off, break them off. You get in a relationship, break it off, break it. And all their life, every, that's everybody, that's all anybody knows. It's like, oh, when the time gets difficult, I'll just divorce. That's not love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. It bears long with one another. Second Peter 3, 9, it says that God is long. He's not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering toward us word, not willing that any should perish. If you truly love someone that is in error, you will do whatever you can to draw close to them so you can influence them for good. Amen. But we just want to go with them and share the truth. Brother, like, there's so much pride. There's so much pride there. But I'm thankful God is not like men. He's not quick to cut others off, to, to divorce, to slap false labels. We're so quick to condemn, criticize, ostracize, demonize, and the list goes on and on. These are false brethren because they don't have the truth on this issue. All the while, the holy and righteous God is looking down upon us and all the heavenly host is looking down and observing with absolute horror the terrible condition of God's people. 
Like I said earlier, there's a lot of fanatical people, especially online, but they're not fanatical about righteousness. They're not fanatical about repentance. They're not fanatical about service. They're not fanatical about doing good for others. They're not radical or fanatical about sacrifice. These are all the things the Bible tells us we should be zealous about. You know, some of you watch YouTube, right? We all watch YouTube. I don't know who you watch, what you watch. And that's fine. You know, you're free to watch whatever, you know, whatever you decide to watch. If you happen to watch and follow some of these men that are so fanatical and extreme and, uh, you know, they won't budge, they're not open, they're full of pride and arrogance, if you want to watch that, go ahead. Just don't bring their spirit into this church. Don't bring that spirit here. Matthew 23. Turn to me to Matthew 23. Verse 2 through 8. Matthew 23. 2 through 8. And I have so much to say. We're going to try to hurry it up here. Saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. They bind very heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets, and they love to be called rabbi, rabbi. You know, are the times any different today? The times any different. Many leaders in the church are no different than that. You know, when I look back, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad I didn't push you guys away. Amen. That's all I'm saying. It's the heart of my message. I'm so glad I didn't push you guys away. Amen. Or you either. I mean, Evelyn, you delivered Heidi. You know? Glenn... I mean, you help you help build all of our houses. <laughs> you know, I remember when you were uh, working on Elaine's house, and, and and you said you called me up, and this was early on, and, and and you were like really struggling with, you know, how much do I associate with these people? You know, it's like you, you know, I, I, Lord, what are you doing? Like these people are heretics. You know, how, how do I, how much do I relate to them? And. You called me up and you're like, Matt, you know, I, I really like your vision and what you guys are doing and, and, and I, I really want to be a part of it, but I have a hard time with, with what you believe, with your belief. Do you remember that conversation? Somewhat. And I said something to the effect, brother, if the Lord tells you to work and help us out and work on this property, praise the Lord. We need it and we will be very grateful for your help. If the Lord, you feel like the Lord tells you not to because of your conscience, praise the Lord. The Lord will help us and he'll find a, find a way. And the next day, Glenn called me and he said, oh, I'm on my way to lanes. We're laying out the foundation. And so I guess the Lord told you to go ahead and help. And I know you have a story in all of this, and the Lord has changed your heart just as much as he has changed mine. Amen. But I really want this to be a witness to the world, what the Lord has done here. Because it may not seem like much, you know, it may not seem like much. But I see the pieces coming together. And something is going to happen very soon. I believe the work in this area is going to explode. And God has a place and a plan and a, and a, and a role for each one of you. 
But since then, Glenn has helped with Elaine's cabin, Delbert's house. He's helped on my house. Uh, we helped build the sauna, which I really enjoy. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's my, uh, you know, Delbert and my, uh, you know, that's our time together. And we sit in there and suffer and, <laughs> and we have our conversations. But I'm very thankful that you were part of that. And you were disfellowshipped from the Seventh-day Adventist denomination because you associate with us. And yet you still don't agree with me. We're still not, we still, we still have a disagreement, isn't that right? And that's true, like we do have a disagreement, but I, I would say that we're more united now than like honestly than I've really seen anywhere else because most churches they're united based upon a set of beliefs or they're united because of the structure but when you take all of that away you take away say like just come when you take away the structure what is there left that's the only environment that I've seen where true unity could take place because there's so many different beliefs and, and, and backgrounds and, and thoughts in this church right here. There's so many, a wide range. And it's pretty incredible that we're still here. That is a miracle. Amen. And you know what? The thing that I've learned the most, I shared last Sabbath at, uh, when we were out there camping, the less of self or the more that self is involved, the less God can do. And the less of self is involved, the more God can do. And that's kind of the lesson that I've learned in these last several years. The Lord is teaching me to set those opinions, set those men, not set the truth aside, okay? Not set the truth aside, not compromise. But, but, but people need to realize, people need to realize and understand how God works. You see, we are like, when the Israelites went to go take the promised land, instead of going forward by faith, they, they shrunk back, and then what? And then they went forth in their own power, strength, and efforts. And look around in the non-Trinitarian movement, look around in the Adventist church, there's only unity there because of the creed and because of the structure. Take that away, which is going to happen very soon, and there will be chaos. There will be absolute chaos. I've experienced it. But you know what? I've experienced, I believe, the real thing. And true unity, which is based upon a relationship. Like it's easy to cast somebody aside and throw them away that you don't know. But in these last couple of years, getting to know, especially some of you that disagree, it's like, I love you guys. You know, I, I, I can't say, I can't be mad at you. I, I just can't. It's like, sure, you may do see, see things and, 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 and like do things and say things that I disagree with. And it's like, oh, you know, Glenn. <laughs> but in my heart, I, I, I love you. And it's, and it's been beautiful because of like to see that what the Lord has done through this. And I want to just briefly mention a couple things real quickly as we close. God sent a tornado. He sent a tornado to destroy Demario's house. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because from that experience, he was able to take the funds from the insurance and the money, and he built a school. And so we're starting a school. That is a miracle. God sent a tornado to destroy his house so he could build a school. I was just talking to him recently. This has been on his heart for 16 years, 15 years to build a school. And it's been on my heart for a long time, and that's why the Lord brought us together. So we're going to have an elementary school as the Lord, soon as the Lord sends us a teacher. We're also launching our school of ministry. 
the Lord has told me that now is the time we need to start our school of ministry and evangelism, and it's going to be completely different than any other school. When Christ taught, where was his classroom? It was in the field as he was laboring. And so as DeMario and I, we've been laboring and, and making steps, and, and, and as people have joined us and we're, we're making progress, it doesn't seem like a lot of progress has been made, but that's how God works. You know, you work and you work, and then all of a sudden, there's growth. And we're entering into that time, and the Lord has told me, now is the time to start the school for self-supporting evangelists. And you know what we've been doing, how we've been preparing to get ready for this school? We started doing construction. We started doing construction and we started working with our hands. Well, why do we start doing that? Well, because Paul was a tent maker and he was able to work with his hands and make money to support the ministry that he was doing. And that's the kind of worker that we're planning to train. One that's not beholden to a denomination or men or a group of men, not one, not a, not a, not a training where their path is already laid out for them and they only have one path. They only have one work to do and that's to hover. And so we started doing construction. Why? So we could teach, we could take a young man and teach him the skills and the trade so he can be debt free and already like leave and have experience and skills and already be ahead in this world. Amen. And so that he can make his own, like make money and do ministry. And so that's why we wanted to start doing construction ourselves and to start learning so that we can start teaching young men and women how to run a business, start a business, run a business. And so that's the school we've entered into. And you know what? It wasn't too long ago, someone approached DeMario, local person, and essentially said, I'm retiring. I'd like to turn over my business to someone. He's a general contractor. And he says, I would like to train you how to be a general contractor. And so, like, this was, I, I don't know, a month ago or so, and then all of a sudden, it's like, well, now DeMario's a general contractor and he has a crew. It's like, when did that happen? You know, DeMario moved here in 2021, I think it was, and he was a city slicker. <laughs> no offense, he was a city slicker. He didn't grow up in the country, he didn't grow up on a farm like I did. But he moved into the country, and, 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 and it's, it's incredible, brothers and sisters. Like, I am blown away what the Lord has done for that man. Like, he went from nothing to learning and construction as far as, like, every, almost every aspect of it in just a few years. And now he's running his company with the intent and the purpose to be able to bring on young men and have them work with us in a crew. You know what happens? Just the other day, we were over here doing the uh, texturing on the drywall. And what do you think we're doing? Talking. We're talking. We're spending time with each other. We're working together towards a certain goal. What do you think that does? It brings us together. The more that we work for the lost and the salvation of the lost, the, the, the more united we're going to be. Amen. And a lot of these things that divide us are, are, are really, you know, they're not really going to be an issue. Because look, I mean, Brother Glenn, if I'm, uh, you know, if, if I'm wrong, if you're wrong, the Lord's going to show us Amen. because the Lord is in control. Amen. And it's like we both just need to humble ourselves and just, and just like realize we don't have everything figured out. And that's where, when, when, when I came to that conclusion, it's like, our oh, Lord, I give up. You know, I, I, I moved here and I was just about ready to give up. You know that? Like, I, you know, I was looking in a place where there was a dark county where no Adventists exist. Did you know that? I, I wanted to move to a place where there were no Adventists because I was fed up, I was sick, I was done. 
And so when uh, I talked to Linford Beachy and he's like, uh, and I'm over here looking at a property, he says, oh, there's a church an hour away. You know, and I was thinking, oh, honestly, I was thinking, oh, man, great. But it's been one of the greatest blessings to me. I know the Lord has brought us here. So tomorrow is being a, you know, he's a general contractor now, and, and we're doing a late, you know, work for this lady in town, and, you know, it's like she liked this job, uh, you know, we're mowing the lawn for her mom's house, and now the neighbor wants it done, and then she told Demario months ago, we've been building a relationship, and, and the Lord has just put us in her, in her, in her favor, and she told Demario, if you guys ever, uh, um, if I ever, ever become mayor, I'm going to make sure the city supports the work y'all doing and the school out there. Well, last week or the week before, the mayor quit and she was elected mayor. I went yesterday to bid, bid a job doing concrete for the city there. And it's, she's pointing out other jobs. Demario and I are so busy, like we need young, strong, hardworking men to come and help us. And I want to learn. Because it's not just construction that we're going to be teaching and doing. Um... We want them to do personal evangelism. We want them to learn evangelism. And so uh, the Lord has given me a plan to reach the lost in our area. And I don't know if it's like a perfect plan or I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that every one of us can be involved in it. And it's basically this. Bobby and I, yesterday, uh, Wednesday, I met Bobby Shelton. Some of you know him, but they have a ministry where they provide books. And it's basically, uh, it's called the Bible Study Library. And in the books, there is a card that people tear out. Well, they simply go into a gas station, go into a laundry mat, and put these in. They, they ask them, you know, hey, uh, you know, we're putting these, we're with the Bible Study Library. Uh, we're putting these out. They're free for you and your customers. You know, would you like one in your store also? And yeah, a lot of them say yes. It depend, depends on the area. So Wednesday, I went down to Little Rock to meet with Bobby to go into and, and plant some of these so I could learn how to do this. <clears throat> well, we went to the worst part of Little Rock. Yeah, Wendy literally, literally, uh, she, she looked up, Googled, what are the worst areas in Little Rock? And that's where we went. And guess what? It was incredible. It was incredible. Almost, I mean, not every store took one of these, but, but almost, almost everyone that we went to, they said yes. In fact, he had never done this, and he had an idea. The idea was, I wonder if any liquor stores would let us display this. And so we went into a liquor store, several liquor stores. And we, I, I have the video here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to edit it and put it online. But we went into the liquor store, and every single liquor store said yes. And we put it right by the door so that as they walk out with their alcohol, what are they going to see? They're going to see Jesus with his arms wide open. Brothers and sisters, I went and I, I was in a gas station and I went and I told them the canvas and I wasn't even done asking if I could put the books and there's a lady, a mother with several children and she said, can I have two? She says, I'm a Christian mother and, and, and like I, I dedicated my life to Christ and, and it's hard out here. I'm trying to raise my kids right in the worst part of a little rock. The devil would have us sit around like the Greeks, sharing our philosophies and, 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 and feeling all high and mighty about ourselves. He would have it just that way. You know why? Because there's, the harvest is ripe and there are people that are dying that are want. They want what we have. <laughs> Liquor stores. Uh, 
you know, you can indulge me for a couple more minutes. I was really, you know, the unique thing about this church, we all know, we live far apart. This church is not in a central location. In fact, there's only four people that live in this area. And the rest of us, what, 20, 30 or so, you know, when everybody, when you count everybody, we're all like an hour away. And some of us, we're an hour like in the opposite directions. And so we're two hours away from each other. And it's really inconvenient to drive an hour to church. You know, it's, it's not very convenient. And, you know, some, some people have suggested that we, we start meeting in evening shade, that we start a church in evening shade. And, you know, that's probably going to happen. I believe it is going to happen. But in my heart, like, I've, I have not felt as though the Lord has led me to do that. Even though others have, have, have wanted that. But it's not, and, and, and the same thing with Demario as well. It's like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know why, but I, I feel like, like I still need to go. I still need to go. That's where, that's where I need to be. And now I, I, I understand. I feel like I understand why we're so spread out. Is because God wants to reach all of this area. Not just Concord, not just, he's not satisfied with one church here in Concord. He wants a church in evening shade. He wants a church over there in, uh, in Newport. He wants a church over in Heber Springs and Melbourne, all of this area in Little Rock. So we're putting these books out. People are going to tear them out and uh, tear out the insert and send them in. We're going to receive those. And when we receive them, we're going to follow up. I want to start in Newport. And I want to put these boxes out from Evening Shade to Newport. And that's going to be a route. And when we start our evangelism school, which is going to happen pretty soon, uh, how I've decided, or I feel like the Lord has led me to, I know this is going to sound crazy to some people, but... <laughs> Like, I just, I just know, I'm, I'm just like, I know, I am so sure that this is what the Lord wants us to do. We're going to get a bunch of young people and, and then me and Glenn as well, <laughs> a bunch of young people, and we're going to load up our bikes with all the camping gear, our food, and we're going to take off and we're going to start visiting people in each one of those cities. And we're just going to camp. And we're just going to go forward by faith and trust God. And we're going to try to find and meet people along the way and, and, and minister to them. But that's the plan. We want to start in Newport. It's about 50 miles. That's a long bike ride. But that's, uh, that's the idea. You know, a year ago, my wife had, a, had an idea to start writing a book. And it's not just a normal book that you just read. It's actually a, a book that teaches very practical things. And that's been a whole blessed experience in, in and of itself. But it's, I never envisioned that I would be into this publishing work. But now I understand. It's not about me and it's not about my family. The Lord led us to do this to establish the underlying work so that we can bring other people in, young people, and teach them. And so not only do we have the construction, not only are we going to follow up on bikes, not only are we going to do this literature ministry, we're also, like, I, 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 yeah, I had to learn how to publish and lay out books. On top of that, it's not just a regular book. It is a scripture song book. And so there's going to be over 200 scripture songs. And through that project, I've learned how to have mu like play music, produce music. Lori, she learned how to write music from nothing. One day she woke up and she could harmonize. Like the Lord has been in this thing. Amen. Like it's so clear the Lord has been in that thing. And it's like, well, why is that? Because this next week, 
there's going to be two young men that are going to come and help us on this project. And, and we're going to start teaching them the publishing work. They're going to go with us to, uh, to, to put out these books. And they're going to go with us to follow them up and to visit the people. They're going to go with us on these jobs. That's the kind of education that we're wanting to establish in Evening Shade. And I, I believe, I have no doubt that it's going to be successful. And this is the reason why the Lord brought us together. And this is the reason why each and every one of us are here. Two years ago, Christina got a call from Michael O'Neill. Do you want to do anything with Barbara? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? And we struggled, right? We struggled for like weeks, months. What should we do? Should we have some meetings? Should we, should we do this? And we felt like the Lord said, we need to start a lifestyle center. We need to go forward. Like we're just beginning that. We already had one session, then, and, and she's coming back, and, and I just, I know at the right time that work is going to take off. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just know it. All the pieces of an outpost center, they're just coming together. And I can't take any credit for any of it, because the Lord has done all of it. The Lord has done all of it, and I think I've said enough. There's much more that I wanted to say, but I haven't changed what I believe concerning, you know, the doctrine, my understanding of what the Bible says. That hasn't changed, but God has changed my heart, and he's changed how I view and relate to others that disagree with me. Amen. I see how proud, how self-righteous. I'm afraid for my, my brethren, honestly. Like I'm afraid for my brethren inside the conference and outside of the conference. Because unless a real deep brokenness of soul searching and contrition, unless we are broken, the Lord is going to pass by the Seventh-day Adventists. And he's going to go to the Gentiles and the stones are going to cry out because we were too proud. Last verse, Hosea. I want to end with this verse. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 through, th 1 through 3. I keep on skipping over it. Hosea chapter 6. There we go. It says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn. He has what? Torn and he will heal us. So what does he do? He tears you, but then he heals. What does he do? He has smitten, but then he'll bind up. It's talking about an experience. After two days will, the, will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to do what? To know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the, the rain, as the latter rain and the former rain unto the earth. You understand latter rain? What has to happen in order for us to receive the latter rain? We got to go on the former, yeah, the former rain and the latter rain. So to go on to know the Lord. But what happened before that? It says that he is smitten. He has torn. You see, we don't, that's, that's something that we don't want by human nature. We want the latter rain, but we don't want to be broken because we'll have to admit where we were wrong. We'll have to admit that I was prideful and I made a mistake. And pride doesn't like that. But if we want to receive the latter rain, brothers and sisters, if we want to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what is the prerequisite? To know the Lord. Well, how do we know the Lord? Because he breaks us. 
He tears us and then he, he heals like a surgeon. He cuts, but he cuts to heal. And then it says that, you know, and then we'll be rise up on the third day. We'll be risen up. Well, why haven't we seen the latter end? It's because we've never, we, I mean, have we been even risen up? Because if you are raised up, you first have to, you have to die. You, you have to die. You have to die to self. Self is still alive. And that's the crazy part. That is what just is so crazy. It's like it's so evident that the, the selfishness and the pride that is, that is permeating, you know, the, the, the churches and the ministries and the individuals. And yet it's the same people over and over again. We're the remnant. We're the remnant. We're the remnant church. We're preaching the truth. We have the present truth. We're the remnant. Or we're the remnant of the remnant. And it's like, but self is still alive. How can you be the remnant? How can you be truly keeping the commandments of God if the love of the Father is not in you? Amen. You can't. Wow. What a great deception. What a great deception. You know, the thing that I learned had Demario and I, and I just praise the Lord for this, you know, because it just, it, it like, it came here just at the right time that the Lord was able to work on my heart and then to bring Glenn and people. But had Demario and I followed, like, our own inclinations, and I think had we run you guys out of the church, none of what has happened in the last several years. We wouldn't have done a lifestyle program. We wouldn't be starting a school of ministry. We wouldn't be having the industries that are popping up. All of that would be gone. I wouldn't know you guys like I do. So that's what the Lord has taught me over these last several years. We would have missed out on so much because we would have pushed. You know, we would have, basically, this is what happens. Men take their own ideas as if it's the Lord. And so they follow those ideas and they get the same results. We need to lay all of that aside. And say, Lord, woe is me. I am an undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Purify my heart. Reveal to me the wickedness and the wretchedness and the pride that still exists in my heart. Reveal that. Break me. Tear me. Tear me open so you can heal me and then finally use me. I'm not satisfied and happy with just, you know, making a comfortable life. And, and, and preaching controversial things so that, so that people will send me money. Like, I want to see the power of God, brothers and sisters. Like, I want to see people's lives transformed Amen. and people healed. I want to see miracles happen. There is so much that God wants to do. We are so clueless. We settle for so much less than what God wants to do because we insert our opinions our pride, our ideas. And that's my encouragement to you and anybody listening. We need to examine our own hearts, set ourselves aside and realize we can have an intellectual understanding, but if our hearts are not pure, if our motives are not pure, it doesn't matter anyways. Let us pray. Father in heaven, oh, Father, Lord, I don't know if anything I said would touch people's hearts, but I just pray that you will take those words and, and just work on each one of us, Lord, that we will examine our own attitudes, our own actions, and not be like those that profess to know God and yet in our works we deny him. 
We deny you in, in the way we treat others, the way we interact with others. Forgive our foolishness, Lord. Pray for all of my brothers and sisters inside the Seventh-day Adventist denomination and outside the denomination, Lord, that they're still people, your people, in all of these other churches. And Father, I pray that you'll give us the very heart of Christ, that we will seek and save the lost and to bring people out of the pit of destruction, Lord. I just pray that you will work mightily amongst us. It's my desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.